Welcome to the Down in Front Podcast, the official podcast of downinfrontpodcast.com. I am your glorious host, Warren, and I'm with my beautiful, beautiful friends, Mike and Brylan. How's it going, guys? Woo! What up? I'm pumped. I'm excited to see your face because I was super bummed I missed the last uh, episode in uh, which we talked about Annihilation. And that by the last episode, I mean the last one before that because I was on for game night, of course. And so were both of you. Uh, but I'm excited to talk about the newest film, the newest sort of Disney film, A Wrinkle in Time. Tons of marketing, tons of stuff that was focused on it. Disney has been absolutely murdering it with Black Panther, so it'll be interesting to see if they're going to be able to follow up on it. The world may never know. But before we get into everything, before we get into our review, before we get into how amazing Blue It looks today, I'm pretty excited to talk about that. I'm going to toss it over to Brylan, the mouth of the South. What have you been watching? Holla at your boy and what you sipping on tonight. What is up this good evening? Uh, I am sipping on one of my favorite bottled drinks that's out there right now. It is Ituin Oi Okcha Unsweetened Green Tea. You can find it at your local Whole Foods. If you want just like authentic green tea in a bottle, this is the stuff to go for. It is awesome. Is the price on the bottle? The price is not on the bottle. Hmm, uh, the price is definitely higher than Arizona iced tea. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, what I've been watching is I last weekend went ahead and finished up Star Wars Rebels. It was its uh, final season and series finale that just happened. And I have to say, uh, Star Wars Rebels is amazing. It's It's one of those things like, a lot of people look at the new uh, Star Wars films or the prequels saying they're not living up to the originals and things like that. And I feel that if you want things that just add a little extra uh, information to these movies that are coming out, or if you just want to have more Star Wars stories to be told and see new cool characters come out, Star Wars Rebels is definitely it. And they take these characters that we're fresh and brand new to the star Wars universe and they make them work and they make you care about these characters over the four seasons that they did. Um, and this is, this is done by the same team that did the star Wars clone wars right before it. Uh, and Dave Filoni is the guy that spearheads all these animated series that they've done for Disney. And he is definitely able to tell some of the best Star Wars stories that are going out there right now. So, yeah, the movies might get all the focus and everything, but what Dave Filoni does with these series is just as good as what you'll get out of the movies. And um, I think that if Disney's smart, they would actually either put give them a shot at some of the movies or at directing or even writing uh, or just let them continue to do this television universe of Star Wars and – if we look at like what Marvel's done with TV and what DC does with TV, Star Wars could cut out I mean, its own little chunk of television where you have serialized hour episodes in the Star Wars universe that uh, people will tune in for and want to watch if you do them well. And I think Dave Filoni would be the guy to do that. Yeah, I love watching the conversations, I think, on Twitter or Facebook between you and Dom. Uh, I think that was kind of funny. And it definitely really wants me to go watch this show, but... I just don't have time, but that's awesome. That's Star Wars Rebels. And where did you watch it? I watched it on, uh, actually, I bought it on iTunes because I like this uh, show that much that I wanted to keep it. Uh, I used to watch it through Disney XD, but then Disney made their Disney Now app that kind of consolidated all their channels that they have. And um, for some reason, it's not showing the latest episodes, which kind of let me down. I was like, Disney, this is your own product. Why don't you have the latest episodes for it up? But I was like, you know what? It's worth buying. So I bought it. 
Cool. Well, th- thanks, Bradlin. As always, it's great to hear your voice, and uh, we really want you home soon. But it's okay if you don't come home. That's all right. We don't mind. Yeah. It rained today, so it was a crisis. Uh, I mean, it was 75 degrees today, so it was a crisis. It was way <laughs> too hot. I literally had to put on sunscreen down here. It was crazy. We got like eight <laughs> inches of snow today. It was a normal day in Massachusetts. <laughs> and that beautiful voice that you heard is one of my best friends, after oh. Rylan, of course. Um, we go way back, all the way back from college. Uh, the Shredder, Michael Blewett. How's it going, Mike? What's happening, guys? So uh, tonight, uh, I don't really have anything good. Um, I pretty much watched A Wrinkle in Time, our feature, and then went away to Vermont for the weekend. Like, took a long weekend out there. Um and I was on a technology ban from my girlfriend. So nothing. I've literally done, I watched Game Night, I watched Wrinkle in Time, and then I had a huge blackout. And didn't hate it. Honestly, it was the first time I've been like disconnected. Literally, the only thing my phone could get was 3G. I couldn't even read oh. the news. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a good experience, though. Uh, How are you going to call for help in there? Well, phone, uh, not, phone calls will still work. It's just honestly, honestly, I kept, gifts gonna work. I kept oh, okay. on thinking that there was like going to be so uh, me and Caroline watched this movie called The Circle together. And there was these like, oh, did you watch it? Not, oh. No, 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 not at that. Like, because, again, we didn't have technology at all at this cabin. But like, so we watched it a couple weeks before we went. And there's the main part of it is like these crazy, like people in these white pseudo Ku Klux Klan type uniforms. Every single night we were sleeping in the cabin, I kept on thinking that was going to like, I kept on thinking I was going to look out the window and see a bunch of weird people dressed in weird costumes. Did you get in touch with nature? Did you build anything out of wood? No, there was a hot tub <laughs> and I spent most of the time in the hot tub. That's what I'm getting after this. I'm excited. It was hot dope. Time oh, no, hot tub time I mean, yeah, if you count like. A second is a second. We were moving forward at a normal rate through time. Anyways, uh, tonight I am drinking Hop Bullet. It is a Sierra Nevada uh, IPA, double IPA. Um, so that's twice the PAs that are in a normal one. Um, that's how beer works. So uh, it's pretty good. Honestly, it's a spring beer, which is hilarious because we just got buried on the East Coast uh, by snow. Um, but I'm really digging it. As a backup beer, I got a cold snap, which is more traditionally a, a winter uh, drink. That's more of a spring drink, right? No, nah, cold snap's winter. This this really? uh, this hot bullet is a spring seasonal. Um, I just bought it because the label kind of looks good, and I definitely recommend it. All right, there you go. Uh, and as always, it's great to have you uh, back. I'm excited to uh, hear your thoughts on A Wrinkle in Time, along with you, Brylin. And um, I am Warren. My name is Warren. I am your host for this evening. I am currently sipping on a bottle of Pinot Noir that I just picked up, and I'm pretty sure they gouged me for price, but whatever. Uh, the name of it is called Run Riot. I also bought this because of the label, and I didn't have a wine opener, so I had to get something else to twist off. I didn't feel like MacGyvering anything. Uh, label's pretty cool. I'll probably see if I can kind of up the up like upload the label because like the O in the riot is like a hoof print of like a boar. So it's pretty cool because that's how I felt about this movie. Uh, what I've been uh, watching later, <laughs> what, what I've been watching, uh, I actually had a chance to watch a good amount of stuff. I think the last time we were talking about, I binged all of um, the crown. Uh, and so I'm done with that show and I finally have my life back a little bit. But the one movie I do want to talk about, I just watched moon that's on Netflix I'm just going to say everybody should probably go and watch that movie because Sam Rockwell is amazing. I think he's so good. Uh, So go watch Moon. That's on Netflix. I want to go see Gringo uh, with David. uh, What's his name, Brylin? David Oyelowo. Yeah. Uh, So David Oyelowo. Who was the uh, who was the voice of it in this movie? Who's the voice of it? I don't know. Let me check. I'll give you a hint. You just said it. David Oyelowo. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a throwback from um, uh, four weeks ago. Clover, Clover, Clover <laughs> Paramount for everybody who don't know. Um, but yes, I went and saw this movie. Uh, I was like, go and sell it. No, I went and saw Gringo uh, featuring uh, a bunch of like, like Charlize Theron was in here and uh, Joel Edgerton was in here. Um, I'm starting to not like that, dude. Uh, 
so first of all, the movie was actually much more entertaining than I thought it was going to be. I had no idea what to expect from the movie. I just have never seen a David O in such a comedic kind of sort of role. Um, it, you know, I was entertained. I was definitely at least entertained by the movie. I'm not sure why they had to make the movie, though, because it really didn't make any sense. And I'm not entirely sure why the name of the movie is called Gringo, um, but it was. So I thought it was fun. Uh, we put up a, a video. I actually had the first chance we actually had uh, Shelby and our friend Anna uh, join us for our Instagram video. So definitely kind of check it out for our live reactions. So that was fun. They also enjoyed the movie much more than I did. Um, but yeah, that's Ringo. Uh, that's Gringo. Sorry, not Ringo. Uh, that's playing in theaters right now. That I checked that out. Uh, if you do have thoughts, feel free to let us know on Instagram. And you'll see that post there. So I'm excited. I'm pumped. What we're going to do is that we're going to get into our full length feature review for a wrinkle in time so we're going to give you a quick pause a brief intermission we're going to have you go get in the bathroom go fill up our wine and we'll see you in a moment for our completely spoiler filled review of a wrinkle in time see you soon bum, 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 bum. <laughs> Front Podcast, the official podcast of DonnaFrontPodcast.com. I am with Brylin and Mike. My name is Warren, and we are going to be reviewing A Wrinkle in Time uh, from the director, who is, I think, is one of the first time sort of big movie directors, Ava DuVernay, uh, writer Jennifer Lee. Uh, this movie stars Oprah Winfrey, Reese Witherspoon, Mindy, Mindy Kalin, uh, Chris Pine, Zach Galifianakis, uh, Michael Pena. I mean, it's a bunch of like great, great name artists, great name sort of actors and actresses. Um, so what we're going to do is that we're going to actually kind of open it up. I'm going to toss it over to um, Brylin and Mike and we'll open up the discussion. Let's let's talk about a bit of um, the casting if you want to. Um, and let's see, you know, what is some some thoughts that we have of the casting? Because I know like looking at it, I think a lot of people were really excited to see Oprah in a movie again. Um, so yeah, I think that's. I mean, <laughs> you get a lot of Oprah. Then she like she goes big, and I was she's, kind, I was sort kind of, sort of bummed binging. that she wasn't peeing behind a house. Like that was a, that was a big loss for me. Is that did that happen somewhere? Yeah, in the color uh, color purple. That's what I thought. Yeah, <laughs> I was like that's an obscure. Re- okay, okay, but that wasn't the last movie she was in, by the way. So, yeah, I know, no, but that was just, her most memorable awesome. role. That's I watched cool. a lot of The Soup growing up, and that was like their go to. Like cut away. I mean, Oprah's great. Um, yeah. I would say, you know, I was glad that they had a, they had such a strong cast. Even the um the the wife, um Mrs. Um Murray Murray Murray. Murray. Yeah, Murray Murray. yeah, exactly. And so I thought that was they their cast was amazing. I was very solid. I was very impressed with their actual cast. I just felt that it kind of fell short a, a couple moments because you just didn't get a chance to. Um, be with those people that we're most known for, which was kind of a good and bad for me. Um, you know, you give these younger actors and actresses some chance to shine. And my goodness, this, I really, I really want to call him Chris, Char- Christopher Wallace, but that's not his name. Charles oh, Wallace. Charles. My goodness, this guy was absolutely amazing. I loved everything that he did uh, for about three quarters of this movie. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but just the opening of when he put those two teachers in his place and he was just being himself, I thought that was uh, awesome. And like Wait, that was really? his test. You were like yeah, the I, anti-child actor. I know. I couldn't I mean, stand that, that turned, kid the entire movie. Turned, this I turned don't... very, very dark, very quick, Mike. A- after a certain point, I'm like, ooh, I'm not loving what's happening. I just like the fact that he was different. And I felt like his character was saying a bit more of – like that casting, right? Like he was saying a bit more than what the movie was about. Like he was the outcast, but he was like embracing it. And he was like loving it, right? Where Meg, his sister, because was much different. Meg was being, uh, you know, that was a, a natural sort of uh, birthing. And she had a mother and father where 
um, Charles Wallace was adopted, right? But he still like embraced everything about it. And um, that's why I ended up enjoying his character a lot more. Yeah, I also thought Charles Wallace, I mean, they were doing something with his character that was really unique. That uh, when they go through the movie, they always say he's very special. There's always something like he's always like a step ahead, either physically in the frame than everybody else. Or like as they're going on their adventure, he's already moved on to the next place. And I thought that was also something really cool they did with the character. Um, but I, I'm I'm there with you. I did like that kid's performance on what he brought to that character as well. So I couldn't stand it. Uh, that kid's voice was a, like a cheese grater to my ears. It was brutal. Every single time he opened his mouth, I just I cringed in my chair. Um, the only time I liked him is when he turned evil. And he had to, like, lower his voice down and have, like, a more, like, ominous, I'm going to get you voice. Like, that was literally it for him. Uh, I did like his, uh, his performance when he was, like, marching around the spear. And, like, he had the kind of, like, hands behind his back and, like, just totally in control type uh, face. Um, that was good. Everything else was so annoying, though. And I don't even hate child actors like Warren does. Like, I, I'm fine with them. This one just killed me. Honestly, our, our like, lead character, Meg, uh, was it, it was Storm Reed? That's her name? Yeah. Um, she killed me, too. She, uh, like, I don't know. She couldn't act her way out of, like, a paper bag. It's she was. She did not have really any presence to who she was. She's very like if you got a kid and said read these lines, it's what you would expect. Uh, yeah, she's just like reading a line and standing there. Yeah, and and it's funny because you have such. I think Warren talked about this earlier, where like you have such great actors and actresses in arbitrary roles, it almost hurts you as a movie where your secondary and tertiary characters are so unbelievably outshining your, your leads that yeah. it, it really hurts because every time they're on stage, you're looking at them rather than who you should be aligning with. You know, you have, you know, traditional. Yeah, like, uh, Go ahead. Oh, ahead. Uh, yeah, I was, I was, I mean, that brings up to my mind that how much I love Zach Galifianakis in this movie something very different that you see him do. He's kind of a more serious role, but he's like in a mentor role as well, where he's wanting to um, help guide this kid on her quest. Uh, and he, I mean, I love the whole like idea of the happy medium and like having to balance, but balance yourself in order to reach that point. And that's like the whole reason for the place he lives. Uh, but I thought that Zach was also bringing the right personality to, and I wanted to see more scenes with him because I think that would have made like the movie stronger. See, I disagree. I think that he was a perfect cameo, much like I think most of them should have been. The marketing in this movie completely was like, see, Reese, Reese Witherspoon, Oprah, and Mindy Kaling in A Wrinkle in Time. It's like, well, no, most of the movie is based around the three kids. So, like, I think you still could have had one of the three big-name actresses as one of the misses, but I think that the other two should have been smaller names because you completely overshadowed them, and realistically, they didn't really matter. You know, it was all about the kids making decisions and progressing through the plot. Um, I mean, for a big chunk of the movie, for the last, like, 20, 30 minutes of the movie, they didn't even show up. They were, they disappeared, and all you were left with the kids. And, and so if you're completely hinging your movie on characters that don't appear through the entire thing, it's a little bit of a mess, you know? Like, this, yeah. this really should have been, like, introducing as... You know, um, rather than rather than come see some people that aren't even in it through the whole movie. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think, yeah, they they definitely with the new actors definitely dropped the ball. Like the actor that plays Calvin, 
Um, I thought that he was just uh, lacking a personality as uh, as Meg, but uh, also he um, had a bit of a more, I mean, he was a bit more creepier than Meg too, that I can understand, like, if you're going to have a teenage kid, like, kind of act like his first time in love or being infatuated with another person, don't make him kind of creepy where he's always saying, I like your hair. And stuff. I can't stand Calvin. Oh, my yeah. gosh. He was oh, so creepy. Was, what, what, that, yeah, that, and I was like, ooh. yeah, I understand, like, prepubescent uh, hormones getting the better of you, but make it a little bit more, I mean, rational to what would happen is it i understand like they the were like trying thing? to like ramp up the creepy like they were like trying to and i know they were trying to probably like his make awkwardness it, make right make their relationship cutesy but it never came off because she was like her look of fear an absolute who are you crazy person like it oh, i didn't like anything at all i was like please just get rid of this just get rid of this like that, that they, ugh, they basically kinda, dropped in and I, you know i don't know if this was the writing versus the like the acting so this might be a, like a kind of a crossover between the two, but like they kind of just dropped us in in the middle of these characters and then expected us to just go with it. Like, oh, yeah. he's the popular ish kid, although they never quite said he's popular. So why is this like, is he a weird kid or is he cool? Like, I don't know. You, is is the you, anorexic shit? You like cool? her because yeah, you like her because she threw a ball in the face of a kid that we then later on tend to feel pretty sad for because of this this it presence has like a af- like affected I at least I think right like we we show how she's super sad and she's upset with herself and she has like a very very, very like low self esteem so Calvin uh, but then we supposed to feel bad for uh, it was just oh man it was yeah yeah I don't know if it was casting yeah. or story but yeah. like it didn't work yeah. no that's a good point. I think it was more of casting um, just because I just think that that character didn't need to be here. Um, but uh, well, as in, or I they mean, could he change. Is, he well, is, he, I mean, if he was in the story, I mean, if he's in like the original book, then I get that. But I think it was more of the writing. I think it's a little bit different. Like, can you say like his lines maybe were either, I don't know if it was, he was told to say it, it that way I mean, or not. I think it was just the actor, mm-hmm. Calvin. And I think there's, and we'll get into this a bit more, but they were, they were definitely trying to modernize this movie a lot to fit into today's times and probably connect with how, how it's perceived that how today's young kids will take things. So I'm, I think they were trying to do that with them a bit. Yeah. I mean, I can see that. I, I, I just wish that they would have done a little bit more. Like we're obviously none of us are, preteens here teenagers but i know the rage is all electronics and technology and like instagram and snapchat and all this sorts of stuff that they didn't really like talk about they didn't really kind of even explore so that's a good point that this really didn't try and reach out to their target audience it like changed so you could go one of two ways you can bring back a beloved child's tale and then make it like a realistic you know, like a one for one, or you could take a beloved child's tale and then put it in the 21st century. And they didn't mm. either. They literally just like took something and alienated its original audience and then also didn't connect to a new younger demographic at all. So really I'll tell you who one. actually came to this movie, because this is what my movie theater was literally composed of was senior citizens and then middle-aged people bring in their young kids to see. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it's weird, you know, even like the locker scene of when Meg goes back to her locker and they like they literally post something on her locker. And I could only imagine sitting there of well, we sent te- like when we when we at least in high school or whatnot, we we were at least talk to people like nobody's gonna see that poster as much as people would post something on like a Facebook group or her 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 photo or something like that, right? Like um, I was just watching Power Rangers, which is on Netflix right now, and they had talked about the fact that they sent a, a text. She t- a text message around, and that's how she was like. Uh, that's why she punched this guy in the face and blah blah blah. But like that made more sense, and that, that was just kind of a bummer. But um, you know, yeah. what can you do? Yeah, I mean, I thought the the concept of like a high school bully was outdated 
yeah over uh, a decade that, ago when i was in high school like there wasn't i don't think that's existed in 20 years uh there's high school bullies. uh there's definitely a high school bullies, well, no no uh, no but like not like that though like i don't i don't know i never yeah. i never saw that i mean the 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 portrayal of the bully in this movie is probably outdated yeah, yeah. i mean not 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 quite guys or it's not, very definitely cookie. That is very. I would say it's not outdated, like because that's we're. I think we're writing a, a weird Warren, line there. Warren, the like, resident what? high school expert. Well, no, I'm not even. Like, a, they're not in high school, but I have a goddaughter who's in the same age as she is. So uh, we've we've definitely talked about that stuff, and um, she's definitely like she's been known to like be like very like uh, uh could be bullying. We kind of talked about bullying too, so that's like something that I want to make sure that like, hey is this accurate or not? Like what's happening in school and people are much more vicious at some points, but it's, it's the cookie cutter. It's like the eighties, nineties versions that I'm like, come on, of course, what's going to happen. She's get so mad. She kind of hits the girl in the face. She goes to the principal's office. Y'all could have wrote something yeah. a little bit more. And the bully is the most beautiful girl in the school. Right. Wears the, the best clothes. And, yeah. And then she has happened to be like, yeah, exactly. And it's like, come, but, and that, I know we, we, we're going to talk about story later, but, yeah. That drop right there was okay. So, are we supposed to hate the principal and then feel bad for the bully? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to feel. But, well, it came back yeah. to that at the end where you were supposed to feel bad for, I guess, everyone on the planet Earth who ever had a bad feeling about anything because it oh. wasn't their fault. Like, oh boy, let's blow it. I'm really excited to get into that. <laughs> Uh, Come you guys, on. yeah, I know. Oh, no, no, no. I, you guys, anything else that you want to talk about casting, or do you want to move over to the story and how it related to the book? No, um, let's, let's... I would say, um, one last thing. Uh, I actually liked Mindy Kelling in this movie. I think she wasn't used that well, but I liked the whole idea of her just quoting lines, and that was her thing. I and loved, loved that. Part. I was um, super on board until I think the last scene that they just didn't care about it anymore. They they set up they set up something and right. just didn't care. And I sat there like, yeah, and, and, and that's not and that's not on Mind, that's not a Mindy Callan. No, uh, not at all. But I think we really talked good. about. Yeah, like uh, she, I know she gave like a great performance of it, and I like that they they mentioned like a line of she transcended language, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. You transcended language. I didn't quite agree with your transcending language to uh, musical lyrics. Uh, the bumblebee. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, <laughs> uh, you know, she said Shakespeare, and she says like Gandhi, and I'm like, okay. And then she said Outcast, and I'm like, well, are you just putting that in because you like Outcast or? Uh, like if you're transcending language, right? Then let's why not show me, for instance, why not show me subtitles in a different language or something? And people are like, huh, what? You know, whatever. Anyways, to, to be fair, that I also like weighs into our picture. that that weighs into our point from like four minutes ago, where we talked about how it seems like most of these teenage references were outdated. Like Outcast, that was incredibly popular. That would have hit so strong in 2006 when I was in high school. Oh my school. god. Like so, that, how old? How old do you think Calvin is in this movie? Uh, I would say he's, he's 15. 14, 15. Okay, and that song that she quoted from Outcast was how old? Twelve uh, years. No, it's yeah, longer 15. than that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an early Outcast. Song. So I'm like, how did you know that reference? All right, Calvin, or my dad. Right, Calvin. I mean, Outcast oh. hasn't been like. <laughs> Don't bring up his no, dad, he's so. not young enough for his dad to have been into Outcast. Oh yeah, his dad. Oh gosh, I told you that. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I'm like <laughs> that guy's not. That guy's not bumping like <laughs> speaker <Okay>. box. <laughs> like, come <laughs> on. I, I guess the one, the biggest thing that I have is that it just felt like a lot of uh, people were just wasted, or I was just confused of why they're in this movie. Um, especially because there's a lot of marketing, and at least the things that I saw that Chris Pine was in this movie that he really wasn't. Um, also, the Michael Pena character, I was so confused, and he was so disposable, um, and it just didn't make any sense. Uh, I, I, I just felt like they kind of 
wanted to crank up the the weirdness scale to like over a hundred with without without answering any questions now i also was thinking in the back of my head that this is probably a, re- a nod or a reference to a character in the book and i think people are going to be like oh okay i maybe i may have i kind of get that so i, I got that but this looking at the, in there for 10 seconds right like looking at i i'm coming completely naked in this and i'm like you know i don't get why this character why does he have red eyes why 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 and he's a puppet so he just falls away that was it, you know. It just felt like it was. They just kind of put him in this movie and just kind of left him. And he like left. He did his like one scene. It's like all right, I'm done. Bye. Um. So I was kind of a, I was just kind of bummed about that. And it just felt like they wasted a, a good amount of talent that they had in this movie all over all, all overall. It was a bummer. See, I I kind of disagree with that. I, I think so. that um Michael Pena, if he was like like the second or third A-lister that they got would have been a really cool cameo because I thought he played the character really well. Um, yeah. That being said, as like the seventh or eighth A-lister they have in the movie, for him to only be in it for like two minutes is kind of disappointing. I would have loved it if the whole cast was B-listers except for like Oprah and Michael Pena. And yeah. Zach Galifianakis, um, like have the weird sense. people that show up every once in a while, have them be big names and then like make those like, you know, elevate those. It just felt like, oh, here's another character that I don't really care about. Yeah. And, oh, gosh. And when they introduce Oprah and Oprah does Oprah's thing, I mean, she's just has her Oprah voice on and is just being a beacon of positivity for Meg. But just the way that they introduce her as giant ass Oprah it just blows my mind that I'm looking at this big screen. I was like, that's probably the biggest someone's ever an actor's ever been on this movie screen. <laughs> I was like, Oprah's already larger than life. I mean, seeing her that size, you're just like, wow. <laughs> I for sure, sh- I, I for sure was like, all right, that's a that's a nod to real life, right? And that, I'm okay with that. Like, I'm completely with okay with seeing Oprah that large because that makes sense. Um, so I mean, you know, we have some things. You know, we t- kind of we talked about sort of the casting and the acting that was kind of all up road into one. But I'm interested to hear. I know at least for me, I didn't read the book, so I had no idea going into this movie at all. But I know that you guys either read part of the book, so you read the book a long time ago, you read more information that was online. But I'm interested to hear like like more of your takes on like the story. Yeah, um, growing up in the olden times, known as the '80s. Uh, This is one of the books given to young kids that would be like that first book you would read where it doesn't, quote unquote, treat you like a child, where it's a more of a serious book that you can relate to more of like the things that Meg is going through or Charles Wallace or Calvin uh, and say like, hey, that's me, too. And kind of it's like that reflection in the mirror that, hey, you're being represented in this book for the first time. And it was def- it's definitely a great book for that. And it acts it does have these ideas of like um that uh, Chris Pine's character is a quantum physicist and like he finds this wrinkle to travel through the universe um using physics and finding this uh frequency that you need to wrinkle through time. But um it's it's also one of those things where it'll give you good ideas to think about and start building interest. Like I know this is one of the books that helped me like start to have a passion for science, but uh, it never goes. It's never like a scientific book. You're not going to learn quantum physics from it. Um, it does have that more metaphysical fantasy tale uh, where it's kind of like uh, the Lion, Witch, Witch in the Wardrobe series or a um or a lord of the rings series and uh it also had a lot of christian overtones which my parents liked yay um that uh and uh and yeah it was like uh like c.s lewis and um madeline langle they both talked to one another and stuff so you could see that they both had influences to each other that they had these analogs for jesus and god baked into their stories uh which you probably don't really get much of that here. Honestly, I one thing. This is small. I didn't even write it down, but you brought it up. 
Uh, one thing that I absolutely hated about this movie was the fact that during the whole presentation scene, I think it's widely accepted that if we are to break the light barrier, it is going to be uh, basically shortening the distance of space time and not necessarily making an engine that can defeat light. Right. And so to get a movie that's supposed to come out now in 2018, like the fact that all of these people were laughing at a whole thing where like, oh yeah, we're just going to bend space time. And that's how we're going to achieve this. It's like, well, no, 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 no. If you presented that in real life right now, not a single person is going to like make fun of you for that. So, no. you know, like, I mean, Twitter, it's not, it's not real science, but like, Come on, give me a break on that. That is, that's not even like, that's what is accepted as what will break faster than light travel and will, yeah, what it, will get us to the different stars. Yeah, it's a theory and it's definitely something that Metal Langle found um, interesting in her youth as well. And I think it makes for a good drop back for the overall story of like kind of the MacGuffin. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, she also is like, Hey, what is the missing piece of this puzzle that people are trying to figure out a scientific way? Maybe it's a more non-scientific approach that actually solves that riddle that they're trying to, um, actually, uh, make it happen. And I think that's like kind of one of the big things about the book is, um, things will actually happen to you based on the faith you have in yourself just as much as the faith you have in others, which um, they, they definitely drop the ball on like actually teaching these kind of themes going through the movie where they have all this potential of talking about like your, how you can be the hope for yourself to either better others or even better yourself or overcome big uh, obstacles. But um, this movie never really sets up a payoff or learning scenes, except for one, which is with the happy medium. They never really help have that building progression that would make Meg an interesting character or a strong character that kids can go see and say, hey, if she can get past that, maybe I can get past something, too. Yes. I mean, oh, man, that is by far, and I think I talked about this a little bit. We talked about it offline about like the message, right, Brylan? But that was one of the biggest issues I have with this movie. Quick, t- quick uh, tidbit when uh, Mike was talking about the fact that you have this movie coming out like in 2018. That again, it's a stereotypical 90s sort of trope, right? Oh, hey, I'm going to talk about some big idea that's going to change the world. And all these supposedly smart people that's going to be there that he spent all his life work on practicing are just going to laugh him off the stage. What? What? Where does that happen? That's not realistic anymore. Like, come on, that's that. Ugh, it's so stereotypical. It it's so comical. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's to the point where it's like, or okay. So the the issue that I have with that uh, message there, Mike, is. If I have an, a radical idea that's so crazy, and uh, but I've been spending all my time and I've gotten to this point that I have this presentation and I can share with you, like, this is what I want to do, and everybody's going to laugh at me, I don't know exactly the message that they're trying to send there. And I was a, I'm a bit upset about that. And I had, a, I had some thoughts about that also. But going off of your point, Brylin, no time, like, n- I mean... Really, I mean, barely it, in this movie, I sat there and I said, you know, where is that progression that Meg is going to turn to this character that that Charles Wallace was in before, right? And then in the end, she she finally um, has a chance to, oh crap, test her, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to talk about that. But she finally has a chance to test her and she sees how glorious it is. The same thing that Miss What's It or Reese Witherspoon talks about the same thing that Charles talks about that. The same thing that literally Calvin has the ability to do that we're not explain why because he has a lot of pent up and repressed uh, but potential I don't emotions think, too. I don't know. Well, they like, really say of Calvin 
Well, she was the only I mean, person Calvin that never tested test himself. No, no, no. It's, he it's, tags it's, along. Yeah. But I don't know if he saw the glory of the glorious. No, Ca- Calvin, Calvin can kind of like kind of see it, whereas Meg is so anti seeing mm. it. Uh, it's, mm. Speaking of like a Christian parable, Meg is supposed to be the character that doesn't see the light of Jesus. You know, like she doesn't see the all power that that has. And then through uh, it doesn't matter if you're like either a prophet, as someone who like Charles Wallace would be versus someone who is a standard believer as someone like Calvin, like those people can see the glory that is Jesus Christ. And then Meg through. Uh, what's it called? Uh, through conflict comes to see the power of the Lord. And then she testers at the end. And it's glorious. So that, that, that's tapping into, no, that's like literally it's Madeline. tapping into more of the book. <laughs> Madeline Lengel is like a diehard Christian writer. Like, that's not like how I feel this should have gone, but like that's how she probably wrote this to be is Meg was her non-believer type character. That's a bit, I mean, I know we're, we're definitely not going to go into the, the category of like, um, the comparison or like the beliefs of science versus religion. But uh, I was also like, I had a, like, I had a big criticism. I had a big issue with this movie of, I felt like they threw away a lot of the science um, that their both of their parents were doctors in physics. And I think Meg even calculates how they're going to get over the wall by looking at the physics of this tornado and how they're going to get into the slingshot and kind of go from there. And even Calvin creepily Calvin says, Oh, how'd you do that? It was physics or it's science. Um, but yeah. And that's part of the book weird. that, I mean, that's the premise of the book is that, yeah, if you have, if you do use something scientific and stuff that the only way you'll actually accomplish it fully is to have that faith part along with it too. So that's, I think that's more of a side effect of the book. Mm. Well, the other thing is that my biggest criticism with this movie was that everything was accomplished so easily, literally just like there was no drama. It was, Hey, this thing is happening. You should do this. Okay, we did this. Okay, that thing is not happening anymore. This thing is happening. You should do this. Okay, we're going to do this. We did this. Okay, that thing is taken care of. Like every single thing was just unbelievably spelled out. And even though there's this like this this ultimate darkness around you that you need to get through that's impossible to stop. Even when it tries to stop you, it's like you brush it off. Like when uh, Mrs. Uh, what's it was like, didn't they like shoot her out of the sky when she was her leaf bird dog form? They didn't shoot her. She was trying to catch Calvin. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. She was trying to yeah. and catch Calvin. That's right. But, it's, but it's, for it's, why did he fall? Because well, he needed the flower. conflict. But then the other thing, like exactly what you said, Mike, was, oh, how do they resolve that? Oprah goes, oh, flowers, go do your job. Yeah. And they catch them. And, and, like, and, huh. and so there, you know, in the books, there was more planets involved, which makes more of a mystery. Like, you know, there was you had to do other things before you just you went to one planet and we're like, oh, we shouldn't go to this one. Uh, I guess we got to go to that one. You know, like it just felt it felt like there was no immersion whatsoever. It was you were introduced to the pl- like this whole concept of a bigger universe, and then immediately had to fight the bad guy, and so well, and it was like, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, I mean, like again, you you were just immediately thrown in there. One little thing I'd like to uh, point out: the gifts were completely different. Um, the gifts were um, what's it gave her love, which what's it was weirdly standoffish with Meg. The whole yeah. time. So, so again, there's that. Um, Mrs. Who she, was a Bible in the movie passage. She gave, well, but so what's it in the movie gave her her faults. And in the book, she gave her love. Right. I'd be yelling at what's it if that was her gift to me because I was like, I already got that shit. Yeah, or I know. What, I know what's going on. Uh, what was going to say uh, <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Who was a Bible quote. Um. That was basically saying like the weak can defeat the strong, which 
whatever. That's every single hero journey ever. And then Mrs. Witch says um, she has one thing that it does not have, but doesn't say it. And that comes back in a big way because um, Charles Wallace is shown to be telepathic with Meg. And so Meg's love for Charles Wallace ultimately is the thing that is able to bridge the gap and then defeat it. Which is cheesy, but it's never explained in the movie. At all. She, Meg's basically just like, oh yeah, Charles Wallace, I love you. Like, that's, that's how it is. And then it just freaks out. Which, I will say this, the design of it was awesome. Like, having the whole synapses and neurons. Oh, no, no, I, I actually really liked it. It was the same as Ego. Yeah, I'm fine with it. That's yeah, fine. thank you. I Whatever. didn't like it. Or uh, uh, Parallax from uh, the DC hit film uh, Green Lantern. The still DC fine. hit <laughs> film Green Lantern. Don't try to glaze that over. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> disgusting. No, I'm. I was still fine with the design of that. It was. I was kind of cool. Um, I would rather we didn't see it. Like, I would rather it's something that is so it, like we transcended. Right, it's something that's transcended that we don't need to actually see a visualization of something. That we we may have seen already. Uh, I think that was like Whoa. my big thing because it was kind of silly, and it was like, well, I know she, they're not going to kill her, so you're just throwing her around, you're grabbing her, and what? It, I didn't. I was not a, a huge fan of that part. There's apparently another level of of abstraction with this, where there is like it, and then it is the uh, what's it called like lieutenant for some greater evil, and so again, not made clear in the movie. That it is not like the ultimate end all, you know, what's creating the like the the stuff that was affecting everyone. Well, they um, said in the movie it was it. So Right, but it's not. Yeah. So so mm-hmm. it makes more sense when you can visualize a lieutenant versus like the overall evil. Damn. I, I mean think I, I, I uh, read the book. Yeah. When the powers of the it, I think they they went too heavy on just having it be a supernatural force, which I think have been much cooler to have situations where you see like normal human um, things happen that are like when if someone like trips somebody or if somebody uh, pushes someone that you're not sure why have those type of situations rather than this tenderly monster and stuff. I would have liked the more psychological approach to it. Um, I thought like they were trying to do something like that with uh, showing Meg her quote unquote un- ideal self. Holy shit. But they do it for like five seconds and that's it. And they throw it away and it's back to let me be a space monster. I had so many issues with that part that just didn't make any sense, but whatever. Um, uh, well, I guess like the and, thing I mean, that I was, well, I was going to mention one other thing, like another thing that is kind of cheesy as well is like at the end of it, like Meg learns to be, believe in herself. She learns to be a warrior of light and warrior of hope. And at the end, the big payoff is when she gets back home and everything is that she looks at the bully in her window, looking very sad and finally decides to wave at her. And that's supposed to make the world a better place or something. I mean, you're trying to share the light, right? And I get that she's yeah. trying to share the light and that's much more than she's done anywhere else. But, you know, I think we, I think it could have been a, a better showing of it because I think in that moment that you said there was more of a focus and the end of uh, Chris Pine's character reunited with his family. Yeah, I, think I mean, I completely more forgot that. Yeah. Yeah, then, they, they completely like, forgot the fact. I was like, wait, he wasn't even a part of the story. Like, whoa. I cared about Chris Pine and his him getting back to his wife more than I cared about Meg's adventure. And no was, one talks about Charles Wallace, who was like the MVP. Yeah, and Charles Noah. Wallace, I mean, is the big standout in this movie. Couldn't <sighs> stand that kid. I love that kid. I love him more than you. I'm sorry. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, it's a, you know, it's kind of a bummer because uh, I really enjoy, I think one of my wins, oddly enough, was the fact that they, uh, you know, Reese Witherspoon's character was a, 
it was weird. I don't know why she was so cold to Meg. I didn't understand where that was coming from. Um, but I, I think one of the wins was when she actually gave her her faults, right? Or at least kind of brought it up and somehow. I thought that was a very powerful or at least very important um, sort of moment of it because that's something I think at that point that was the, one of the realest part parts of it besides Charles Wallace in the beginning just being himself the only the, really the only thing is oh so you look inside you look at these these demons these things that you have in, inside of you but you embrace them as that's up they're a part of you um, and you have to live with your faults you have to live with your mistakes and the things that you chose to do or, you, or this the who that makes you who you are um, I thought that was very interesting. I really liked that. The glasses didn't really care too much about it. Um, that I, I had a feeling of, oh, you're gonna use them for like two seconds and then throw them away. Yep, exactly what and happened. Cool. That was so weird that the glasses, what they turn out to be, is to be able to so you can see physics calculations in the world. Yeah, but that then Charles Wallace just brushes his hand away and gets rid of it at all. So I'm like, why didn't you do that when she was walking up before? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, doesn't make sense. Yeah, it got it got too easy. Yeah. Uh, anything else you guys talk about the story before we move on? No. no. I mean, so the last thing that we'll talk about, just about anything else. Um, and I know at this point that uh, I was going to bring up like the message and what message they talked about. We kind of talked about it a little bit uh, in between, and we talked about that like really when we talked about kind of casting and whatnot, but. You know, I'm just kind of bummed because I was really excited about this movie and I really wanted this movie to succeed. And it it was odd that they marketed it as a Chris Pine movie and there's no name actress of Meg's character. There's no name actress. I believe her name is Storm. I, I Storm don't know Reed. Storm Reed. Reed. Yeah. And so she just kind of sort of kind of was on the side. Uh and the majority, I think about 85% of the movie, she was just being negative, standoffish, and kind of closed off. And so I just was very confused of what message are you trying to send your demographic or these you know, children, teenagers? What exactly message are you trying to send? Because it's very complicated. Um, and I think that was the point for make it be complicated because emotions, right? Things that people deal with are complicated. I get that. And that's why I was really excited about that false line. But in the end, what exactly what message are you trying to send? Um, and it, it just felt like they just kind of put some stuff together and they focused more on like the character and Meg's love for Charles Wallace outside of, I think we mentioned it before, Meg's love to herself. Like at what point, when did she like accept herself at all? Like when did she like go ahead and say, I'm going to be who I want to be and kind of go from that? Yeah. And uh, I think they, um, the the story sac- is sacrificed a lot, I think, just to set up some visual set pieces. Yeah. And the visual effects, I really liked them. I thought it had a unique visual aesthetic to it. Um, like, I liked how the dresses were designed, the clothing was designed for all the characters, especially the ones you meet along the adventure. But I liked the, the design of the planets or Mrs. What's-It's, like, leaf-flying creature. I like that design as well. I like the white room that they had for when they were on the um, the evil planet. I forget the name of it. Um, but um, overall, I think that story, this story suffers because they made a movie that's going to have the aesthetic to teach you all these things because it does come off as a very nice, beautiful, colorful children's story. But it's... There's, there's no backbone to it to tell to get you into why we're in this colorful land in the first yeah. place. Well, even the like, the monotonous scene that they go and they they are they're walking in this this land and they go that they talk start talking about that they're hungry and then you have the kids bouncing the ball and then the mothers come out and says oh dinner's ready. I was very confused of where that scene came from. I was like, is this the same movie? What are you? I, I didn't know what that meant at all. What do you, what do you guys take on that? What do you think about that part? I mean, that, I mean, that's when they first land on Kamastos or whatever it's called. Kalamazoo. What Kalamazoo. It, yeah. Michigan? Whatever it is. I, so to me, that was like the planet trying to mimic what they would go along with. And we saw it almost work. 
which again was like June to the point I said earlier where there was no dramatic moments in this film where, you know, the mom, if it was, if it had more to do with the movie, the mom should have lured Calvin in the house and then the two kids should have had to go rescue him. But it didn't because it was a two hour long movie and they couldn't get involved in some arbitrary tertiary subplot to rescue him. You know, and they had to... what is it? Uh, Calvin says, "Like, oh, what are you cooking?" And it's like, "Oh, that smells good." And he starts walking. The Meg just says, "Don't! It's a, it's a trap." And he's like, "Okay, uh, okay, yeah." <laughs> it, it, it completely was just like, "Hey, we have to bring these things up because we have to show the planet is trying to like mess with the kids." But it didn't do anything because who cares? And the I guess the only thing that was able to actually mess with them was Michael Pena, which now that I think of it now, like it'd be it'd be funnier if Michael Pena was in more of those roles. Like if Michael Pena was like the lady who was just like, you should come inside. Yeah, that'd be fun. Or like, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Tactics. I thought he's, yeah, right. Like, like, like that, was uh, the, Charles, Charles Wallace saw through the illusion immediately. And then well, Calvin ate like a pound of sand. So it's funny because in the books, they make that way more clear that they make it uh, that Charles Wallace is the only one that can see through the illusion. And he realizes that the only way Meg can get access to it is if Charles Wallace goes and is captured by it. So it is a self-sacrifice because out of necessity, whereas in the movie, it becomes like this thing where it's like, oh, well, yeah, I guess I'm captured now. Bye. You got to rescue me. Two plus two equals four. Four right. plus four equals eight. Whereas in the yeah, whereas in the movie, uh, not the movies, the book, he literally is more of just like, hey, I'm the only one that can like get dug out of this by these two people. I need to get captured so that I can expose it to everyone else. And so there's more. So much better. Yeah, there's more of a master plan. It's not like just like some random hodgepodge of crap thrown together. Sorry, the the plot deviated. The plot was just so unbelievably easy for these characters, and it so it was so far removed from the like the actual book. It was dumb. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I mean, it's I guess there's just things in which like I would have loved to see them. I love the idea to see Michael uh, paying his character as all these like obstacles. I think that would have been hilarious, giving him way more sort of. Uh, uh, like ability to kind of show his range. Um, I think we can also we could have also seen, and I think we mentioned this before, um, Brylin, the, the the small small tidbit, but the issue is that Mindy Kaling's character started talking normally when she was full power at yeah. the end of the movie, and then she went back and started talking in quotes. And so I'm like, wait, you can talk full power when you're weak, but then you're strong enough and you need to talk just fine. And then you go back, make up your damn mind, because th- that at that point it didn't make any sense. Um, but I mean, I I choose to do this now. Yeah. I mean, I think it would have been also interesting, right? I, I would have loved to have seen, I don't know if it's possible, but I think it'd been pretty cool if, um, and call me crazy, but I think it would have been pretty cool if all of those witches were all Oprah. There's a big Oprah. There's an Oprah that talks in quotes. There's an Oprah that's kind of sort of standoffish and kind of normal. There's an Oprah, Oprah loving each other. And I think that would have been very interesting, especially in this movie. I think it would have been pretty cool because who doesn't want more Oprah? But it also would at least push the scale a bit more because we talked about Blewett of A-list actors, right? If you have one person, this one ideal of a person, but these different witches and they're different people entirely, but Meg only can see them as one person because she's closed yeah. off to it. Or, you know, we, there's yeah, a lot of ways be, that we could have went There's there. supposed to be analogs of the Holy Trinity anyway. So, like, it does make sense that it, they're supposed to be beings that are three but are also one at the same mm-hmm. time. I think it would have been cool. I, I, I mean, I, I would have I liked that because you literally would have just two characters, right? You don't have to worry about casting these people. You have Oprah was a side of good, and that would have been a, a hilarious nod to real life. Uh, and then you have Michael Pena's character with the side of evil, and then them like going back and forth, light and dark. Um, and I, I think that would have been interesting to see him. It's kind of like the the big bad wolf almost. Like you see him put like these weird like the um, disguises on. I, I like that idea, uh, Mike, a lot. That'd be pretty cool. 
you want to talk about music, Mike? How do you guys feel about the score? Um, okay. I didn't really notice it, so I thought it was. I would assume it was very conventional. To like be fair, I think it tied into the entire basis of the movie where everything was just a major chord. Um, there was no tension in the score whatsoever. It was literally just like one happy chord going to another happy chord with no no sense of movement whatsoever. Um, which made sense because the whole plot of the movie was just one happy moment going to the next. Mm. You know, yeah. there was a little bit of dramatic, you know, uh, with like the characters, but it was basically like, oh, you're you're a wizard, Harry, followed by like, you can travel through time and then you could beat the ultimate evil. And then in two hours later, we were done with the whole story. Yeah. Or even like, um, hey, your dad's in peril. We know where he is. Let's help you get to him. First, we got to go to this planet. First thing you do when you get to that planet Let's frolic. Right. <laughs> and just run through the meadow. Enjoy yourself. Well, no, no, you have to find you have to find balance. You gotta, I mean, she you never... got to you got to find your dad. Oh, let's frolic a bit first. How can you fly? Oh, it's because of physics. OK, then why did he fall? Uh, oh, physics. Right. <laughs> yeah. So let's get into some uh, some lasting thoughts, some uh, lasting ideas of what do you want to leave the audience? I'll start with uh, Blewett here uh, and say, Blewett, some lasting thoughts for The Wrinkle in Time. Yeah, so this movie, it skipped in the books a couple planets. And I think that's actually kind of an interesting thing where this should have been a Netflix show. 100%. Like, they could have done... See... I don't want to say Netflix show because the only thing I can think of is a series of unfortunate events. So let's give it Hulu. So let's say Hulu as like Amazon. Amazon as Amazon's big competitor in the children's whatever market to a series of unfortunate events is going to be um, a wrinkle in time. And you can make 10 episodes and, you know, they each deal with a certain subtopic and they're all half hour long. And that, what is that? Like a five hour movie? Yeah. Half hour. Yeah. 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 And those five hours would cover everything in the books. And I think that would be way more effective because essentially they boiled it down to nothing. Like they literally, they tried to distill the plot to a couple certain things to get a couple certain like overall uh, feelings going towards the movie. And then they burn the water away to nothing. There was literally nothing at the bottom of the pan. Um, mm. And that's the movie they made. And it was hot garbage. Skip it. Uh, Brylin, lasting thoughts for a wrinkle on time? Uh, yeah, this is a very pretty middle-of-the-road movie. So it's visually very good to look at. Uh, there's some really cool set pieces and everything. You do, get some, you do have a an, an really unique cast here that do have some really cool performances um but the plot is a jumbled mess and it's uh well not necessarily a jumbled mess it's just very generic and basic and there's i mean the big thing about this is to grow as a person you need conflict and uh you need obstacles in your way and they don't really put any obstacles in the way for meg to grow and that's like the biggest letdown is if you're going to teach a lesson you got to have the problems to solve in order to teach that lesson. Uh, and so I would find it, I mean, it's going to be one of those things you'll find in the Walmart bargain bin one day as a Blu-ray and just like say, oh, 99 cents, a wrinkle of time. Might as well. Nope. Um, no. Nope. Or, I mean, you're going to watch it on Netflix one Sunday afternoon while you're washing clothes or something. Nope. <laughs> it's, nope. Uh, it's definitely something you don't want to just go out to the theater and see. Uh, it's going to be right there with Snow Dogs and um, Air Bud 2. Ooh, uh, it's just, <laughs> damn. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> that was great. Oh, this shit. Movie. That's amazing. <laughs> it's going to be right there with Snow, Snow Dogs. Oh, yikes. Cuba Gooding is best role. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you know, 
I was, I think the one thing, it's just me just being super disappointed and kind of sad in this movie because I think one of my favorite genres uh, is animation and uh, at least what messages they're showing the kids uh, and what message you're trying to send um, from a director who's an African-American woman um, to the lead star who's an African-American woman in this movie that she's portrayed as being like mixed races. Um, I just feel like I just wouldn't recommend this movie um it just was very sad because they didn't really explain things too much it was very muddy like even if you strip out all like the issues we talk about with casting right if you just stick to just the script itself i was almost confused of what sort of message they're trying to send um and some of it was biblical some of it was like science and some of it was just you know you just have to believe hard enough well there was just too many things that were just way too confusing and they, they could have been much easier to say, this is what it is. This is what it is. This is what it is. And this is this message that we're trying to send. Um, and I'm just bummed that, you know, Disney signed off and made this movie, uh, shortly thereafter of, you know, a movie like black Panther. Right. And we have to, and the only reason why I'm like comparing it to that was that's Disney's last movie. Um, and it's kind of a bummer because we see one sense that that's that's something that really opens my mind up of like thinking about it a little bit differently. And then you see this of damn, like what what happened? I know not all movies can be perfect, but come on. Um, so I wouldn't recommend watching Wrinkle in Time. I would definitely skip it. I, you know, I'm battling between saying I'm not going to say I hated this movie, but I really, really didn't like this movie. This is probably going to be in my bottom three. Uh, right now is the worst movie I've seen this year. Um, Certainly I've the seen, biggest miss. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and those those things have to happen, right? But, you know, I really hope uh, Ava DuVernay, DuVernay? Ava uh, DuVernay? I think DuVernay. DuVernay. Du- yeah. DuVernay. Ava D? Ava D? Ava D? Oh. Ava D. Um, I, I really hope she gets more work, because I think she was, like, the producer for Selma and, like, a lot of other good work. She directed for it. Selma. Yeah. Produ- uh, I this said was, producer, This was her okay. next... This was, like, her follow-up to Selma. Oh. Yeah, it's brutal. <laughs> oh, okay, I believe it. I, I, I think she can bounce back. I, 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 for sure, I'm glad you told me that now and not earlier. Um, I think she de- can definitely bounce bounce back. I just think you. I, I, I think definitely she got can definitely bounce back. Yeah, definitely has talent. I, I I like some of the works that she put into this movie. There's just a lot that I didn't like, uh, and I wouldn't recommend this movie. And with that, we are the Down in Front Podcast, the official podcast of downinfrontpodcast.com. Brylan, the mouth of the cell, where can we find more of your work? Uh, you can find me uh, believing in myself a little bit more on Twitter, <laughs> at Brylan, B-R-I-L-U-N-D. Um, I'm also on Instagram at I am Bryland. I put up many movie reviews. I'm going to put up something about Star Wars Rebels very soon, so watch out for that. And when I'm not in beautiful, rainy California, I am uh, usually the host of the Gamescast, twitch.tv slash downfrontpodcast. Uh, I don't know if there's been many broadcasts. I haven't been keeping eyes on it. But uh, not, sorry. Hopefully, hopefully every once in a while, we'll see Warren hop on and pull his hair out while he plays Monster Hunter. I have logged almost 200 hours in Monster Hunter. I'm really glad that I am not doing that right now because me and Abbott did beat the game. And we're kind of sad we beat the game. So, oh, there's an end to it. There is an end, kind of, sort of. We beat like the story, the first storyline. So we're playing through again. But I'm actually off of Monster. I'm off. Like I'm on vacation from Monster Hunter for a week, uh, as I'm in um, Florida. So I'm glad to be able to like sit back, read a book for once in my life. Yeah, I saw that they got some pretty cool Devil May May Cry costumes that are coming out for it now. There's new monsters and new missions that's going to release in tomorrow. So they're literally just keep pumping stuff out. So definitely check in. I'll, I'll make Abbott start texting more about the, um, that game. But thank you, and always great to see your face. Uh, Michael the Shredder. Leslie, actually his middle name. I know you didn't know that. Blew it. Uh, where can we find more of your work? Yeah, I really didn't know my middle name was Leslie. It's uh, good to know, though. Um, yeah, you can find us at Maya News Band or Maya News Music. Uh, we'll have music eventually. Any shows coming up or anything? Nope. We got Any- super lazy. <laughs> like, unbelievably lazy. 
Well, hopefully you, next time you play, I'll be in town because I want to go watch you. Yeah, that will be uh, in the next year. I guarantee we play before 2019. Yeah. It's funny because he's not even the coolest Mike in the band. No. Strange. Oh, no, no, no. I'm third or fourth. We At only least. have three people, but I'm still third <laughs> Definitely or fourth. fourth. <laughs> yeah, def- you name your guitar, Mike, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I am Hor- I am Warren. Whew. Uh, you can find a bunch of our work. Uh, definitely check our website out, downinfrontpockets.com. We have all, literally all of our work we have there. I do want to give a special couple shout-outs. A special shout-out I want to give to Mike Blewett for making the music for our SoundCloud. So definitely go check that out because he's been putting a ton of work and doing all of our theme music for the actual show. I think somebody asked me of, you know, who makes it, and he's right here in the flesh. Uh, in beautiful flesh so definitely go check out our website um check out our podcast definitely leave some comments as well let us know like what any other reviews that you want to have um the other kind of call out i would say is we've definitely opened up our discord so for all the patreons we do have an, an amazing new tier called prices on the can because the price is, is on the can. Uh, and just for 99 cents, $1, actually, uh, you can actually join our Patreon channel. We're going to be chatting about other movies, any other reviews that you want to see, and anything all like that. So definitely kind of check us out. Down for podcast.com. Thank you so much. And that was our review of A Wrinkle in Time. And we will see you next for our review of...